Hey everyone, how you doing? Welcome to uh, today's Modern War Institute Speaker Series event. Uh, today we'd like to welcome Dr. Victor Cha. Uh, he is the Director of Asian Studies and holds a DS Song Chair in the Department of Government and School of Foreign Affairs at Georgetown University. From 2004 to 2007, he served as Director for Asian Affairs at the White House on the National Security Council. We were responsible for Japan, the Korean Peninsula, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Island nations. Dr. Cha was also the deputy head of the delegation for the United States at the Six Party Talks in Beijing and received two outstanding service commendations during his tenure at the National Security Council. He was also recently announced as the next ambassador to South Korea. Uh, before we get started, I do want to say we will have a lot of question and answer time. Dr. Cha has requested we have a lot of questions. Um, when you ask a question, please wait for the mic to come over to you so that we can get you recorded on video. With that said, I will hand it over to Dr. Cha. Um, well, thank you for that kind introduction. I need to correct one thing, which is that um, <clears throat> the, uh, the press has nominated me <laughs> as the, uh, potentially the next ambassador to, uh, to Korea, but the White House has not yet. So, um, but, uh, uh, but thank you. Thank you for that. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is not my first time to West Point. I've uh, been here a number of times before, and each time I come back, I'm amazed at how much new development is taking place here. Um, some of you may not know this, but in the university business, the metric for a university that's doing well is if you see construction on campus. Um, that usually means the university is doing well, and so you guys seem to be doing uh, seem to be doing pretty well here. Um, uh, I grew up an hour just south of here uh, in the Bronx, so um, this whole area, the Hudson River area, is home to me. So I always uh, feel very comfortable coming back um, to this part of the to this part of the country. I, li I now live in Washington D.C. <coughs> and teach at, at Georgetown. Um, and so today, what I'd like to do is start off with I'll start off with some comments about the North Korea problem, at least the way I see it. Um, and then I'd really like to just open it up for questions because, um, frankly, I give a lot of talks on this topic all over the country. I was in Missouri last week um, uh, speaking on this issue, and it, I get kind of bored talking about it. So I'd much rather hear your questions and try to do my best to answer them. Uh, and I may not be able to answer all of them because, you know, North Korea as you all know, is, it's an opaque regime. It's famously known as one of the hardest intelligence targets in the world. <clears throat> but we'll do our best to try to, to answer some of these questions. Um, <clears throat> so I guess the place to start is, um, is um, first to try to understand what we're talking about when CNN blasts these headlines that say, you know, this is the proximate security threat. Uh, Trump is going to war, all this sort of stuff. For the first is we have to put this all into perspective. Right? <clears throat> so um, one of the ways to think about this is um, by looking at some of the metrics. So between uh, 1994 and 2007, between 1994 and 2007, North Korea did 16 uh, missile tests and one nuclear test. Right? From January of 2008 to uh, December of 2016, no, January 2008 to September of 2016, uh, they did 80 missile tests and four nuclear tests. In the first few months of the Trump administration, they have done, I think, 23 missile events and uh, one nuclear slash H-bomb test. Right? <clears throat> and at the rate they're going, in four years of Trump, they're going to be well over 100. If they continue at this current pace, if we straight line project, they'll be well over 100 tests within four, four years. So by any metric, there has been a step increase in North Korean missile activity and nuclear weapons activity. Okay, so in that sense, what you're seeing in the news, what you're reading about in the newspapers, there has been a change, right? There has been a definite change in North Korean behavior um, um, over the past 
eight or nine years. Right? <clears throat> so the question then always becomes why. Right? What are they after? Right? This is the question I get when I go into the White House and give a briefing. It's the question I get when I take out the garbage right at home and my neighbor's walking by with his dog and he goes, oh, I just read you in the Washington Post. You know, what do they want? It's the same question all the time. Right? <clears throat> So one of the things that they want for certain is survival and security. Right? North Korea is a small country of 22 million, maybe 24 million people. Um, it was abandoned by the Soviet Union in 1990 when the Soviet Union normalized relations with South Korea. It was to an extent abandoned by China in 1992 when China normalized relations with South Korea. Um, uh, it went through a horrible famine in the mid-1990s where 10% of the population died uh, because of famine. Um, and today, it has uh, an extremely successful country directly across the border, South Korea, 12th largest economy in the world. Right? It has US troops in South Korea. Uh, it has Japan right across the sea, East Sea, Sea of Japan, whatever you want to call it. It has the Chinese to the north and the Russians to the north. And so it, has, it is all by itself in a sense. It is on a peninsula, but it is an island in that sense because it feels like it has nobody to help it. Right? And so in that sense, uh, they feel like nuclear weapons is the ultimate security guarantee. Um, <clears throat> that sort of a logical rendition of how they may think about their own uh, uh, think about their own position, <clears throat> but it's also something that I heard directly from them, um, and uh, um, and this is I mean just for you, this is not to share with the whole world, but. When I was uh, involved in negotiations with them uh, in the six party talks, which were these multilateral uh, negotiations that took place in China with the United States, Japan, the two Koreas, and Russia, um, and we negotiated two, two agreements with North Korea in 2005 and 2007. <clears throat> but in the course of those negotiations, you know, I was one of the nego negotiators. I had my instructions, right? I had my instructions from the State Department about what I was supposed to do. And what often happens in a negotiation, particularly with North Korea, is you have your instructions, so you give your initial brief. They have their instructions, they give their initial statements, and you know, you're this far apart from each other. You're not even close to each other. And that's when the negotiation takes place. And for the most part, when you negotiate with the North Koreans, they are very professional, they are very businesslike. You know, they go through their talking points. Um, <clears throat> on the sidelines, they will ask questions, usually about U.S. domestic politics. Like back then, they asked a lot of questions about Hillary Clinton and things. So they, back then, they didn't ask about Trump because back then, nobody thought ever, right, that uh, Trump would run for president, let alone win. Um, but then occasionally it got heated on the sidelines when... Uh, they kept saying, uh, we, um, we want the United States to end its hostile policy towards North Korea. And, um, um, and you know, these negotiations take place uh, sometimes for 10 hours a day, and then you spend the next six hours at the embassy reporting back and um, um, getting on the stew and talking to Washington. So they're very long days, and you know we did this like two weeks at a time, not much sleep, and you get a little tired. And then one time they said, um, it's because you have to end your hostile policy toward to us. And I just, at that point, I just had lost it because I had heard it too many times. So I said, so what do you mean by end our hostile policy? And they said, um, end, your, end your plans to invade us and attack us. And I stopped and I looked at him and I said, attack you? What do you have that we want? I mean, like, what would we invade you for? Your agriculture, right? Your economy? Like, you have nothing that we want, right? 
And I probably shouldn't have said that, but I was just, <laughs> I was just a little bit tired at the time. But then his response was very interesting because he said, um, he was very calm and he said, so remember, this is um, 2005, 2006. He said, and he said this without even, even blinking, he said, you attacked Iraq because they didn't have nuclear weapons. You attacked Afghanistan because they didn't have nuclear weapons. You will never attack Iran and you will never attack us. Right? So that probably wasn't in his talking points, but it gave me a real sense that Survival, right? A big part of the purpose of their nuclear weapons is survival. Whether they think we're going to attack them or not, they feel like it's the ultimate security guarantee. Now, the point that I want to make next is the point that is often missed, right? Which is, sure, the press, everybody says they need these weapons for their survival. However, we have to remember that North Korea is a totalitarian dictatorship, right? Throughout history, totalitarian dictatorships tended not to be status quo oriented countries. Right? So if all you were interested is in your survival, your status quo oriented state, as long as you can assure that, you should be fine. Right? Um, but North Korea is a totalitarian dictatorship, and I believe that they are not status quo states. They are predatory states. Of course, they want survival, which is a part of the status quo. But once they get survival, they look for gains. Right, so what are the gains that they're looking for with their nuclear program? <clears throat> and so I, I feel like what they're looking for is they want, the reason they want to reach the continental the United States, reach Hawaii, San Diego, Chicago, New York, Washington, the reason they want to be able to reach as far as they can with these nuclear weapons is because they want to decouple the security of South Korea from the United States and Japan. Right? What do I mean by decouple? They essentially want to render, uh, uh, render less credible the U.S. security guarantee to defend Seoul, even if U.S. cities might be under attack. Right? It's the old adage that Charles de Gaulle talked about with regard to France during the Cold War, where he said the United States is not willing to trade Paris for New York, right, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Soviet attack. By being able to reach the continent of the United States, the North Koreans want to instill doubt in the minds of South Koreans, Americans, and Japanese that the United States and Japan are not willing to risk Tokyo or Los Angeles or Chicago in order to defend Seoul, right? Um, that is sort of decoupling South Korean security from that of the United States and Japan. You'll, you've noticed that North Korea has, has been firing multiple missiles at Japan. Right? Four <laughs> missiles that landed 250 kilometers off the Japanese coast and missiles that fly over Japan. It's all for the same purpose. They're trying to demonstrate they can hit anything in Japan. They can hit anything in Japan. And the United States needs Japan if we're going to defend the Korean Peninsula. Right? We need to be able to flow forces through Japan if we're going to defend the Korean Peninsula. That is a political decision that the Japanese leader has to take. You know, is he going to be willing to risk Tokyo to defend Seoul? Right? When all those forces and materials start coming through Japan and come under attack from North Korean missiles. Right? By decoupling the security of South Korea from the United States and Japan, then if they can do that, the North Koreans feel like they have fundamentally altered the strategic balance on the peninsula. Right? Because then they can start doing stuff, conventional provocations, um, uh, uh, submarines. Right? They can start doing things that will start to rattle stock markets, create capital flight, and then they will feel they have they have altered the balance on the peninsula. Right? This is a 25-year strategy that they have been pursuing. When they realized 25 years ago that they would never be able to match South Korea in terms of soldier for soldier, tank for tank, <clears throat> and they chose to pursue an asymmetric strategy based on nuclear weapons, uh, ballistic missiles, and cyber. 
right? And that is essentially the strategy they're pursuing now. Um, since I've left government, uh, I have on occasion engage, engaged in what's called track two dialogue with North Korea. So when there's no official dialogue taking place between the United States and North Korea, uh, sometimes former officials are asked to participate in dialogues hosted by groups like the National Committee on American Foreign Policy or University of South, uh, California, San Diego has a dialogue, different dialogues um, uh, with North Korean officials who wear their think tank hats. Um, and there is a confidence expressed by these North Korean interlocutors in terms of where they are that I've never seen before. They feel like their strategy is working. They feel like they are very close now to this ICBM capacity to threaten the United States, uh, which will then allow them to try to decouple uh, South Korean security from that of the US and Japan. So, uh, and I've never seen that sort of confidence before in their, in their, in their talking points. Um, so that's what their objective is. So what is the policy? Um, and so again, like I said, I'm not gonna speak for too long because I, I really would prefer to have a conversation with you based on questions you might have. So what's the policy? Um, so you hear um, President Trump and the media talking a lot about military options. And so sure, it is the responsibility of any president uh, when he or, he or she takes office, when you have a problem like this, to review all the current military plans uh, and to ask the military to update those plans and to ask the military to come up with new plans, right? to think of new ways of dealing with this problem. Um, but as we all know, we can come up with many military options for North Korea, and I've seen many military options for North Korea. <clears throat> but every time there's a military option for North Korea, we're faced with the same question, which is the president wants to know what's the percentage chance success of the mission. Right? If that's defined in terms of significantly retarding North Korea's nuclear missile program. And given that we don't know where all of it is, the percentage chance of success, unless you're willing to completely wipe out the country, the percentage chance of success is fairly low. Right? The next question that you get is, what is the percentage chance of escalation and significant casualties if, this were to, if the North were to retaliate? Uh, and there, the percentage chance of um, retaliation and escalation, in my estimation, is well over 70%. Right. So if the success of the mission is less than 30% and the percentage chance of escalation is well over 70%, that's a tough decision to make right, for any leader. That's a tough decision to make. I mean, whatever it is, 20 million people in Seoul, of course. I mean, in terms of Americans, we're talking about, I don't know, if you can include Japan and Korea, 500,000 or more. American citizens and soldiers, sailor, airmen, marines in Korea and Japan. <clears throat> that is essentially the population of a medium-sized U.S. City, city, right? It's the population of St. Louis, Missouri, Corpus Christi, Texas, Sacramento, California, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right? That's what's at risk uh, when you have to think about the military option on the Korean Peninsula, right? <clears throat> so obviously very difficult. It's a very difficult thing to consider. So of course you need to prepare um, uh, for that, but then you look at, well, what else can you do? And the, the next logical step is economic pressure on the regime. Right? And so that is what the United States has been doing. It's been putting a great deal of economic pressure on the regime through sanctioning of, of North Korea. The common view is sanctioning on North Korea. I mean, we've been sanctioning North Korea since the Korean War, right? So how much more sanctioning can we put on the regime? And the answer is there's a lot more. <coughs> um, if you compare the level of sanctioning against Iran during the Obama administration in the run-up to the JCPOA, um, to what sort of sanctioning was taking a, a place against North Korea, it's not even comparable, 
much more sanctioning against Iran. And so that is what we have seen in terms of U.S. policy and U.N. Security Council resolutions is a focus on much more sanctioning of the country. <clears throat> if you talk to anybody in the White House today about North Korea, they will recite one statistic to you, and that is that 90% of North Korea's external trade today is with one country. Right? 90% is with one country, and that is China. Right? So from April of 2017 in Mar-a-Lago, when President Trump first met President Xi Jinping, he focused on how China needs to do more to sanction North Korea. Right? And, you know, I think, <clears throat> you know, people criticize, they say, well, you know, China's not pushing hard enough, China could do more. China could always do more. They could always do more. Um, but as I was saying to folks earlier today over lunch, if a year ago I had said to you, China's going to cut off one-third of their oil exports to North Korea. They're going to cut off all seafood trade with North Korea, which is the primary trade that takes place between the two militaries. It's going to cut off all textile trade with North Korea, which is the single largest generator of hard currency for the economy today. Um, uh, and uh, its bank, the People's Bank of China, is going to end financial uh, transactions with North Korean entities. If I had said that to you a year ago, you would have said, Professor Chow, you're a great scholar, but I don't believe you, right? It's not going to happen, right? And that's where we are today, right? That's where we are today. Um, $2.7 billion worth of North Korean experts, exports today, $2.7 million per year in, of North Korean exports today have now been cut off and sanctioned. Right? Um, the other big revenue generator for the regime is overseas labor. Right? So they basically send their labor overseas, um, at, like to Kuwait, to Kuwait or um, uh, to Qatar, and then the money gets paid directly to the regime. Right? And these people basically work for free. That is all starting to be cut. Countries are starting to send all those people back. They're starting to deny visas work visas for all those people. So little by little, more and more of this is being cut. Um, and the thing about sanctions is you have to remember that throughout history, sanctions as a coercive diplomatic tool don't work until they do, right? That's what everybody said about the sanctions against Iran. They're not working. They're not working until we got the JCPOA, right? And then people are like, oh yeah, maybe they worked. It's the same thing with North Korea. Sanctions aren't, you know, everybody will say sanctions don't work until they do, right? And we are only really six months into this process right now. Um, so, um, um, so we shall see. And then the last piece of the policy is, um, uh, is um, diplomacy, right? That, the purpose of the sanctions are, uh, as Secretary Tillerson has said, to try to set up a negotiation, um, <clears throat> to try to at least stop the missile testing and hopefully degrade and end uh, the nuclear program. Um, frankly, I don't think that piece is, well, is as well fleshed out yet because the focus has been on the sanctions. Uh, but, um, uh, but again, in that sense, if the military solutions are too difficult to contemplate, um, then uh, one has to think about whether there is a diplomatic solution uh, once the sanctions really start to have an impact. Um, so um, going forward, you know, right now going forward, this is going to be an interesting week because um, U.S. and ROC are doing big exercises uh, around the peninsula, and you have the Party Congress in China. It starts tonight, I think, tonight, tomorrow, Wednesday in China. Um, so what all of us who follow this are looking for is the North Korean provocation, right, that will take place largely in response to the exercises, but at, at the time of the Chinese Party Congress. I think from the diplomats' perspective, 
they see, uh, once we get out of this week, they see a five-month window because basically we have then a five-month window until the next major set of U.S. ROK military exercises in the spring where they hope to get some diplomatic traction. Within that five-month window is also the Olympics, right? The Winter Olympics will be in South Korea uh, starting in February. Um, and in case any of you are interested, you're all welcome to come to the Winter Olympics. Um, they're supposed to be at 250,000 ticket sales right now. They're at 50,000, um, so they're way behind. And it's in part because the Chinese are not buying tickets, right? Because the Chinese, you know, the Chinese are upset with South Korea for the THAAD deployment on the Korean Peninsula. So they have undertaken this not so subtle economic sanctioning campaign in which they've kicked out all South Korean companies. And so part of that is they're not buying a single ticket to the, to the Winter Olympics. Um, but again, within that five month window, uh, you have the Olympics and um, in the past, sporting events have always been a way to try to um, uh, make space for diplomatic contact, for um, uh, the so-called Olympic truce. Uh, so there's aspirations for that to be helpful. Um, <clears throat> but, um, uh, but then once we get into the spring, I think then we get back into an exercise provocation cycle uh, that, will be, that will get harder and harder. Um, uh, to, to handle. Um, <clears throat> so I hate to always end discussions about North Korea on such a negative note. I'm thankful that we had this discussion before you ate lunch because usually when I speak before lunch, then people don't want to eat lunch afterwards because they're so depressed. The one, the one positive thing, the one positive variable for change with regard to North Korea uh, that people don't talk much about is the society. Um, <clears throat> North Korean, you know, there's no freedom in North Korea whatsoever. Right? Um, however, North Korean society is changing in very small but significant ways. Um, and it is largely because of the market. Right? So North Korea is a command economy system, which means everybody gets everything from the government. Their rations come from the government. Everything comes from the government. Uh, but over the last two and a half decades, markets have been created in North Korea, official markets and black markets. And now more and more people get their livelihood from the markets than they get from the government. Right? So we've at CSIS, my other hats at CSIS, a think tank in Washington, D.C., We've teamed up with NGOs that operate on the Chinese-North Korean border, and we've sent them in with questionnaires to ask North Koreans like, about daily life. Um, um, they don't, so it's North Korea, so we give them these questionnaires, but they don't actually walk in with a clipboard and they go, hey, you know, Mr. Kim, could you answer this survey? You can't really do that in North Korea. So they kind of do it in the shadows, wherever they can. But the interesting thing that we found, like one of the questions we asked is, so how much of what you get every day is from the government versus how much do you get from the market? Right? And so of the people that these NGOs went in and talked to, so 85% of the respondents said they get more from the market than they get from the government, right? 85%, right? <laughs> So when that happens in a command-style economy and closed political system like North Korea, that means society is very slowly starting to separate from the government because they don't rely on the government anymore for all their handouts. Right? And, so, and, 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 so, and there are now cell phones in North Korea. I mean, there are cell phones that you can't, like, you can't call out to West Point from a cell phone in North Korea. They have an internal system. But again, internal system means people can SMS each other, right? So they go to this market and they see that the government is shutting down this market early. So they text people and they go, go to that market because they're shutting down this market. Or they go and they see the price of rice is this in this market. What is it in the next market, right? And the point of all this is whenever you have markets and you have communication, 
you're starting to develop a civil society. Right? Um, and that is new for North Korea. They have never really had a civil society. So the most positive change that's happening in North Korea is very much at the grassroots level, and it is that society is changing largely because of the market. Um, and that will create more performance demands by society on the government. Uh, it will also create anger anytime the government tries to shut down market activity. And these dictatorships, at one point or another, always try to shut down the markets because they feel that it's creating too much independence. Right? So if you're ever looking for triggers for instability in North Korea, if you read a report that says the government is re-denominating the currency or trying to shut down the market, that's a trigger. Right? Because as markets have developed in North Korea and society, they're going to be very unhappy if the government tries to do something like that. Okay, so I think with that, I've spoken for a good 30 minutes. Why don't we just uh, open it up to questions? Thank you for your attention. Sir, to what extent do you think that rhetoric from the president via Twitter and the news media further destabilizes the situation? Okay, what's your name? My name is Cadet Carlson from Company H3, sir. And what, where are you from? I'm from Michigan, sir. Michigan, okay. Um, um, so I got to be careful here, right? So for some obvious reasons with the camera on, so I'm going to be very careful here. Um, um, so what I would say is, <clears throat> I think the best way to answer this is, so I just laid out for you what I think are the four pieces uh, policy, which is, you look at and update military options, focus on economic sanctions, work with China, leave the diplomatic door open. Right? Those are the four elements of the policy. I also explained to you what has been the trend line in North Korean behavior right? uh, over the past eight years and over the first seven months of this administration. So what I would argue is that although the language may be more colorful in this administration, in terms of some of the social media stuff and everything, I would argue that the core elements of the policy that I just described, thinking about military options, sanctions, China, and diplomacy, would basically have been the four components of the policy if Hillary Clinton had won, okay? or if Jeb Bush had won, right? or even if, I would argue, even if Bernie Sanders had won. These would have still been the four elements of the policy. And that the trend line in North Korean activity would have been the same if you know, Hillary or Jeb or Bernie had won. Right? Because North Korean testing started almost immediately after the election of Donald Trump. So in a sense, the North Koreans did not leave room for him to consider anything else but the this sanctions, this sanctions path. So in that sense, I think the language might be more colorful, but I really don't know if we'd be in a different place today um, if anybody else had been president. Sir, Cadet Johnson, Company G3 from Dallas, Texas. Sir, there's a common narrative or a common idea that China uses North Korea as a buffer state, so to stay, in order to prevent a US-backed South, or US-backed <coughs> unified Korea uh, right on its border. To what extent is that still the case with China as it continues to normalize relations with South Korea, or is it still cling on to that notion? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I do think that there are still... So first I would say I think there's a, there's a vigorous debate inside China today. Right? And I'm really looking to see once we come out of this party congress whether there's going to be a change in uh, China's North Korea policy. There's a vigorous debate, and one side of the debate, as you described, is, is this view that North Korea is a buffer state. As bad as it gets in North Korea, it's still a buffer state. Um, whenever the Korean Peninsula has been unstable historically for China, it has not gone well. Right? Either the Japanese invaded, or there was a war, or something. It never goes well for China. And the PLA is taught this. right? The PLA cadets are taught this in their history classes. Whenever the Korean Peninsula is unstable, 
it is not good for China's interests. China has border disputes with every country around its periphery. The only country with which it has negotiated a border dispute settlement and given in to the other side has been North Korea because they just cannot afford instability on that peninsula. So in that sense, there are many who believe it's bad. What's happening with North Korea is bad, but still it's better than a United Korean peninsula with the U.S. military right, allied, with, uh, allied with South Korea. On the other hand, there are others in China who say, look, <clears throat> as long as North Korea continues to do this, the United States is going to put more THAAD batteries on the Korean Peninsula. They're going to deploy more SM-3 Aegis. They're going to integrate their missile defense systems with Japan and South Korea. They may even consider autonomous or dual-key strike capabilities for Korea and Japan. That is not good for China. Right? In the end, that is worse for China. So that's the other side of the debate. People are saying we need to find a way to deal with this North Korea problem because while in the short term it's an irritant, in the long term what the United States is doing in the region is worse for China. Right? And that's still an unresolved debate. Right? It's still an unresolved uh, debate. And so I think coming out of the party congress we'll see if there are going to be any real changes in the, in the policy. <clears throat> Sir, Cadet Austin Montgomery, Company B3 from Greenwood, Indiana. Sir, my question is, in the case of war with North Korea, is the U.S. policy to set up a new government in North Korea or a unified Korea? And if the case is unification, is South Korea's government and economy able to absorb North Korea at this time? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so on the second question, I think the answer is yes. Uh, but it would be at great cost. Right? Um, the, um, the last case of this sort of unification we saw was Germany. The economic gap between North and South Korea is much larger than that between East and West Germany. Um, relatively speaking, South Korea is absorbing a larger population than the West Germans did. So almost across any metric in terms of comparing German unification to Korean unification, it's going to be harder in the Korean case. So th but they can do it. It's just going to be harder, and it will be costly to them. Um, in addition to that, <clears throat> like the folks in South Korea that are your age, the division of Korea is something they read about in a history book, right? North Korea is not even in their consciousness, maybe for their parents or their grandparents who once knew a united Korea, but for everybody else, it's not even in their consciousness. So if the government says, look, we're going to unify with North Korea, and by the way, there's going to be a 25% surcharge tax on your income tax, people are like, wait, wait, you know, I didn't ask for this. So I think there are a lot of things that trend against this, but at the same time, I think if the opportunity presented itself, it would be hard for any South Korean government to say no because you know, the division of the peninsula is an aberration in Korean history. Right? And so it would be hard for them not to want to take advantage of that opportunity despite the costs. Um, in terms of U.S. policy, it's very difficult to answer without knowing exactly what the scenario is. Right? <clears throat> I think um, if North Korea were to actually fly a ballistic missile at Hawaii or Guam or the west coast of the United States, um, as President Trump said, what did he say? We'll totally destroy that country. Or as Bill Clinton said um, you know, two decades before, that will be the end of North Korea as they know it. Right? And so I think that would be the policy, that that would be the end of the country. Um, but as often the case, things are never that clear cut. Right? They, never, they will never be that clear cut. And so it'll greatly de then depend on the, on the situation. Sir, my name is Cadet Emma Davenport from company I2. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. So you mentioned that the third prong of North Korea's strategy is cyber capabilities. Mm -hmm. How has their offensive cyber capabilities changed our relationship uh, with North Korea? Change whose relationship? America's relationship. 
Um, <clears throat> so the cyber, the cyber threat is very real. Um, uh, the cyber threat is very real, and it is, as has often been the case with North Korea, we tend to underestimate their capabilities until they show something that shows they've, they've gone much further than we have. Now, I don't mean to diss the intelligence community in this sense because, as some of you may know, whenever the intelligence community as a community has to make an assessment about an issue like North Korea, you will have varying assessments, right? And then it gets all gets you know shaved down to the lowest common denominator, which tends to be a conservative estimate rather than a more forward-leaning one. So, so in that sense, I'm not saying the intelligence community got it wrong, but in most cases, we have tended to underestimate their capabilities. We did a study at CSIS. We started a study at CSIS on North Korean cyber about six months before the Sony hack, just because we, I don't remember why we did it, but we did it, right? We decided to do it. Um, and so we have one of the best cyber experts in the country, James Lewis at, at CSIS. And we went around and talked to Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, we talked to the whole private sector. Nobody had a study on North Korean cyber. Nobody, right? Um, and that was because everybody was focusing on China. Right? Everybody was focusing on China. <clears throat> then they did the Sony cyber hack, and people were very surprised at that capability. <clears throat> um, so what our study found was that, and, and this is where I will admit that I disagreed with the Obama administration's policy, um, and, and that's not a political statement because I actually went to college with Barack Obama. We were, we're the same age. I went to college with him at Columbia. Um, he was involved in black students' organization. I was involved in Asian Students' Union. We used to argue over budgets. It, <laughs> His career has gone a little bit better than mine, <laughs> oh, but I don't hold that against him. Um, but they, they, he decided to classify the Sony hack as cyber vandalism, right? which I don't think was the right thing to do. It was cyber terrorism. Right? And when you call it cyber terrorism, it triggers all sorts of things in the US government that were not triggered when you call it cyber vandalism. Our study had found, has found that the primary agents for North Korean cyber activity are the same entities in the North Korean military and in the party that um, are responsible for terrorism, that do terrorist, terrorist acts. So this is cyber terrorism. And, and they are very aggressive uh, and they are going after private sector, they are going after official, and it is continuous, right? it is continuous. So it is a very serious uh, problem. And, I'm waiting for, you know, we're all waiting for the next ICBM test by North Korea or the, next, the, 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 next, the first successful bona fide SLBM launch. But I'm worried that the next thing might be something major on the cyber side that, that we're just not, not ready for. Uh, Sir Cadet Muncy, company I2, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. My question is, one of the solutions I've heard for the North Korean uh, problem is a revolution within North Korea. Uh, what do you see the, as the likelihood of such an event occurring? Um, so, um, when uh, most of the country is starving, right, it is, when most of the country is starving, it is hard for society to think about revolution when they're trying to get their next meal. Um, having said that, as I mentioned earlier, to me, the market is the biggest variable for social change in North Korea. Uh, because, again, because of an independence of mind, uh, but also because North Koreans through the market are actually saving money now. Right? So, you know, they, the government has allowed, the, the, has allowed um, families to grow their own farm plots. So there's, in whatever farm that you have, there's whatever you till you have to give to the government, but they're now allowed to keep some for themselves as a way to try to increase productivity, right? Because if you work for yourself, you're going to work harder than if you have to give it all to the government. And so what people have been doing is taking that stuff, going to the market and selling it. They're making money. Um, you're creating 
personal savings, even if it all sits in a mattress uh, in your house. <clears throat> what the North Korean government is going to do, in my, in my view, is sooner or later they're going to say there's too much personal savings in the system. Right? That creates too much autonomy. We have to either get, take that out, impose a tax, re-denominate the currency. Right? They did it once before. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they re-denominated the currency, which basically meant we have a new currency. Um, it is whatever the whatever note. Um, you can take your old currency and exchange $200 worth of your old currency for the new currency. All the, any other money you have, you must return to the government because that paper is now worthless. Right? That created real anger. The only evidence we, anecdotal evidence we have of active resistance in North Korea was when they re-denominated the currency. Because what happened was, you know, if you had $10,000 in personal savings that you had worked for five years to scratch together, and all of a sudden you can only change $200, what did everybody do? They took that $9,800 and they went right to the market to buy anything they could because they knew the money was going to be worthless. So like a price, you know, I don't know, like a, a I don't know, a, what is that? A Dell computer, although they don't sell Dell computers. You know, it's great. A Dell computer that might have gone for $800 on the market was selling for like $8,000 because... You know, and it was just chaos in the markets because people were trying to, um, to spend all this money that they could not uh, exchange anymore. Created real anger. The North Korean government actually executed the finance minister because they, they realized there was so much anger. They go, all right, our bad. Here, here's the finance minister. We're going to shoot him, right? <laughs> so everybody don't worry. It's going to be okay, right? But my point is that they can't stop doing this, right? If, if you're so obsessed with control, you can't accept that society is growing more independent. And sooner or later, they're going to do that again. And to me, that would be the first credible trigger for some sort of internal dissent. It might not come from people rising with pitchforks. It might come from a general that basically just shoots them in the head, right? Something like that. That has happened in the history of Korea. Uh, both on the north, uh, on the south side too. That that has happened. So, um, so you know that is possible. But um, but again, to me, that's why I find studying what's happening in society very interesting because I think it has broader ramifications for the regime's stability. Dr. Cha, thank you so much. Sure. A lot of the cadets in the room, you know, we study strategic studies, and I wonder if you could pull the aperture out a little bit more. Because we're, we learn about, you're one of the few people who's done policy as well as academia. And when you look at North Korea, and we, we look at what's going on with the Iran deal, for example, and one, one critique is that why would you pull out of an Iran deal and then try to negotiate with your other hand with the North Koreans? But an academic would say it doesn't matter. Each, each roll of the dice is unique. So if you make a red line in Syria, it's not going to affect your red line in Ukraine. Policymakers say everything matters, and everything is kind of consent, uh, uh, sequential. And so, if you, um, you you mentioned the Libya and and, and Iraq, and that you've you've heard mm -hmm. from North Koreans who have said essentially that because of the um, because of what happened there, of course we're going to uh, you know our, our nuclear weapons is a non-starter, and it's not a uh, something we're going to ever bargain away because it's a it's it's suicide in effect. Mm -hmm. Do you who, so who's right, <laughs> and and how can academics? And I'm I'm thinking about this question because it's really important to strategic studies yep. beyond North Korea. But what, how, why do academics and policymakers have these different views on 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 these kind of questions and, and, and is there one that's you think is more germane to maybe the North Korean issue thanks. Yeah, it's a it you know it's a great question and it's it's one I do think about a lot as somebody who works in scholarship but also has had the opportunity um, to be involved in policy. Um, and I would say um, in the end what it really comes down to so which one, who thinks they're right? So academics think they're right. Policymakers think they're right, right? I think that's the that's a simple answer. But I think what it often comes down to is um, I don't know. I would say that academics and some of our theories of international relations and foreign policy um, really, over the years as, as they have evolved, 
have given less and less causal influence to uh, the role of leadership in individuals, right? Um, you know, John Mearsheimer has a structural answer for U.S.-China relations, right? Um, but policymakers who encounter John Mearsheimer say, that's ridiculous. I mean, because who's president in Beijing and Washington matters? Who's managing the policy matters, right? Joe Nye says, you know, if you treat a country like an adversary, it will become one, right? So there are, I think, the big differences that um, for many on the scholarship side, they see causal influences that determine outcomes in foreign policy and international relations that are beyond the control of individual decision makers. Um, whereas in policy, decision makers believe that decisions matter and that they shape the future direction of, of policy. And, um, and I've seen this particularly in the debate over China, over, the, over uh, China's rise and how to deal with it. Um, you know, the structural argument uh, versus the argument that, that it, it is very much path dependent. But it also, I'm sorry, just to, yep. it raises the question of rationality. And one question we always get in these forums is, is, is North Korea rational? Yeah. I just wonder if you could. Yeah. So um, here I do think that scholarship and theory is helpful because, yes, on the one hand, uh, I, yeah, I do think, I mean, North Korea is strange, right? I mean, the only, for, the only American that Kim Jong-un has met with is Dennis Rodman. Right, that's strange, right? I mean, that is really the only American that he's met with is Dennis Rodman. Right, the biggest threat to U.S. homeland security today, the only American he's met with is Dennis Rodman, um, and he's got a really funny haircut and all this other stuff. Um, but they're rational in the sense that um, they made a rational decision to invade in June of 1950 when they believed that the United States had written the mainland of Asia outside of. Um, uh, outside of um, the Truman administration's defense perimeter. Um, <clears throat> they're rational in the sense that they have been deterred from a second Korean War ever since then. Um, as we said, they're rational in the sense that they feel like they need weapons, these weapons, to survive. Um, so they are more rational. But th what, what theory tells us is that um, there's rationality and then there's higher risk tolerance rationality. Right. And so the dangerous thing about North Korea is that even if they're deterred from a second North Korean invasion, they have a much higher tolerance for risk than the rest of us do. Right. They're much more willing to leverage the peaceful status quo than the rest of us are. And that will tend to lead them to make rational decisions about provocative actions because they believe that in the end, we value the peaceful status quo more than they do, and we will always try to talk them down or walk them down or negotiate them down. So there's that sort of rationality, uh, that sort of rationality too. All right, so we have one, we have about two minutes left, so time sure. for one quick sure. question. Cadet Jason Jong from Company A3. I moved here from South Korea to Kansas City, Missouri, seven years ago. My question is, what is South Korea's strategy against North Korea under President Moon compared to under President Moon's administ administration compared to the United States, and how is the difference between uh, two governments' policy affecting the current situation, sir? Sure. Um, so, um, South Korea is an ally of the United States. It's a military ally of the United States. It has fought in the United States with every war since the Korean War. South Korea had the third largest ground contingent in Iraq. Uh, it was the second largest uh, combat force in Vietnam. Right? Um, so South Korea is an ally, right? a military ally. Um, but it's a democracy. Right? And so for the past 10 years, we've had a conservative government in South Korea that was basically music to our ears. Right? We just agreed on everything. Now we have a progressive government in South Korea. Right? <clears throat> Um, the first progressive government in 10 years. In fact, the last time we had a pro progressive government in South Korea was when I was at the White House. And it's many of the same guys and gals who were in that government 10 years ago that are in this government. Maybe that has something to do with why they want me to go to Seoul. You know, maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. 
Um, and pro when we say progressive in South Korea, we're not talking about progressive on social issues. Right? Progressive in South Korea means a desire to seek engagement with North Korea and inter-Korean reconciliation as the answer to, um, to uh, the, the, this problem that we now face today. Right now, um, there's, I think, very little daylight between the United States and South Korea, even though you have a progressive government, just because North Korea has basically given nobody any room except to push sanctions, right? I mean, their behavior has just been really over the top. And even if you're a progressive government, you have no room, really, to go anywhere but uh, all of these sanctions. And so I think that's where the South Korean government is today. Having said that, as I mentioned earlier, the Olympics are in February right? uh, in, in South Korea. The Olympics were, the, the initial bid for the Winter Olympics for South Korea was by the last progressive government in South Korea, right? Because Olympic bids are done two Olympics in advance, right? So it was in the last progressive government in South Korea. As part of their argument for why the Olympics should be given to South Korea, they said, the Olympics location, the Winter Olympics location is in, is in Pyeongchang, which is in Kangwon province in South Korea. Kangwon province is the only province in South Korea that was divided by the 38th parallel. So they couched their whole bid in this sort of inter-Korean reconciliation thing, right? So we're getting closer to the Olympics, right? They had always seen the Olympics as a way to try to promote inter-Korean reconciliation. The crisis doesn't seem to be getting any better. Right? So they're getting nervous. Right? They're getting really nervous. So while everybody's on board in terms of sanctions, you just never know. You know this progressive government may try to throw a Hail Mary you know, to try to see if they can reach some sort of accommodation before the Olympics take place, which wouldn't be a good thing, frankly, for, um, for Alliance purposes. But I think the, 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 the broader message there is, as the United States with an ally like South Korea, they're a good ally, right? I mean, when we want them to be there, they are there, right? Whether it's on climate change, whether, like I said, whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan, they are always there. But we have to understand that they are a democracy and you will have conservative and progressive governments, which will make it harder. Uh, but it doesn't mean we can't do business together. Like I said, I was at the White House when we had the last progressive government in South Korea. We had a lot of friction, frankly, on North Korea because they wanted to engage more than we were willing to engage. Uh, but at the same time, with a liberal or progressive South Korean government, as I said, they sent ground troops to Iraq. They sent PRTs to Afghanistan. We got the free trade agreement, got visa waiver, NATO plus three status, put Korea into the G20. Like We were able to do a lot of things. Um, uh, with Korea. So these alliances go much deeper than small disagreements over policy. So. Well, Dr. Cha, thank you so much for taking the time to come talk to us. It's my pleasure. For anyone who doesn't cl have class, feel free to come up. Uh, we'll be here to take questions for a little bit uh, and make sure you come out to other MWI events. Thank you.